Well, come and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are uh, the word of the Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God who speaks, that you spoke the universe into existence and that you speak through your people and you speak to your people. Thank you, Lord, that as we come around the scriptures, that we can hear your voice. So, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us as well through the pages of your, your word. Amen. Right. 1 Samuel chapter 16, the first uh, 13 verses, fairly well known, um, uh, used this morning at the Wednesday morning service and is the, one of the texts set for Sunday. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they came to meet him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Arise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon da David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Right. We have... Uh, the continuing saga of Israel as God moves and changes the people from uh, being led by prophet uh, judges to being led by kings. And we've seen how Samuel came on the picture as we've looked through uh, through the, the book of, of, of Samuel that it began with Hannah's prayer and then the dedication of Samuel as a young boy. Um, and Eli, the priest at the time, and his sons were, um, well, Eli, we're not told, was, was wicked, but his sons were wicked and he didn't stop them. So a prophet came and spoke against them. And when the Lord called Samuel, he also came with a, a message of condemnation for Eli and his sons. If we follow the story through Samuel, they, Israel goes to battle and the ark is captured by the Philistines. 
And at that battle, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. When Eli hears the news, he also dies, um, falls off his chair and breaks his neck. The Ark of God was captured, and there's a story about it going to various cities in uh, in Philistia. And in each of them, they told the hand of God was heavy on the, the people. And so eventually they send the Ark back to Israel, um, and Samuel takes up leadership. And he uh, overcomes the Philistines, and he leads uh, Israel. And then Israel comes to him, the people come and say, your sons aren't uh, the same as you are, and so we'd rather have a king. And God says, well, that's fine. If they want a king, we'll give them one. And Samuel then anoints Saul, and he becomes the king of Israel. He rescues the city of Jabesh, and uh, all the Israelites say, yes, this is now our king. And at that point, Samuel steps back from leadership, and the, the reins are now in the hands of Saul. Uh, the, a battle is, is uh, formed, and Saul goes out to fight, and Samuel's going to come to offer sacrifices before the battle, and he doesn't come, and he doesn't come, and he doesn't come. And eventually Saul uh, decides, because all the, the, the Israelites are busy deserting and running away, he says, well, I'll just offer the sacrifice, which he does. And just after he's finished, Samuel arrives and he rebukes Saul uh, because of that. And we're told that the Israelites had no weapons. Jonathan, Saul's son, and, and Saul had weapons and nobody else did. Uh, Jonathan attacks the Israelites, the, the Philistines, and they get beaten. And uh, uh, Saul wants to condemn him because he... he uh, ate some honey. Saul had said, if anyone eats, they're going to be executed. We're going to fight until the battle's done. Jonathan eats some honey, and Saul wants to kill him. The people stop it. So Saul already, at that point, seems to be losing the plot more and more. Uh, they then go to uh, another battle um, uh, against the Amalekites, and the instruction was given Go and totally destroy everything amongst the Amalekites. Um, and Saul says, I will do that. And Samuel comes up to meet Saul after the battle, um, reading in chapter 15, the previous chapter. And Saul meets him with great joy and says, um, uh, uh, he went, uh, sorry, Samuel went to meet Saul and Saul had gone off to Carmel. And he set up a monument in his own honor, we're told, and has then went down to Gilgal. And when Samuel reached Saul, Saul said to him, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instruction. And Samuel says, then what is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of cattle? And Saul answered, oh, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord our God, but we totally destroyed the rest. And Samuel said, that's enough. The Lord told me last night that uh, you've uh, lost the plot, essentially, and you're going to be replaced as king. Uh, you were told to destroy the Amalekites and uh, everything that they owned, almost as a burnt offering to God, and you didn't. And Saul's uh, uh, response is, I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission. The Lord had signed me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, uh, the best of what was devoted, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So he's making the excuse, we kept the best to sacrifice them. And then you have a wonderful saying of Samuel, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And he says, because of your disobedience and your rebellion, God rejected you. I'm leaving you as well. And that was the uh, the final time that Samuel saw Saul. He, Saul went off back to Gibeah, and Samuel uh, went home to Ramah and never saw Saul again. And so you have this, this convoluted background where the 
the whole system is uh, had a king, which is now beginning to crumble, and God comes and says, go and anoint David as king, because Saul's out of the picture, um, and things need to move on. So uh, Samuel rightly is a little nervous about going to uh, to uh, Bethlehem to anoint somebody because he says Saul's going to hear about it. And if he does, uh, that's going to be a problem. And we know that uh, Saul certainly reveals himself to be the kind of king that you would be worried about if you're Samuel. And you think of David's story, and the minute Saul realizes David's becoming more popular than he is, he then sets out to try and kill him. And because of Saul's antagonism to David, David ends up on, on the run, despite the fact that David had done nothing other than support Saul up to that point. And so Saul's jealousy is certainly a big issue in his life. And Samuel recognized this and says, if I just go, this is going to be a problem. And so he takes a heifer and says he's gone to sacrifice. Which, as I was reading, it raises an, an, an interesting uh, question in my mind and a, a question that I think we often sit with. And people sometimes come and say, uh, you have to speak the whole truth, the absolute truth, and nothing but the truth in every situation. Um, and sometimes where you say, well, I can't really do that because it would be unkind to speak the truth. So better to be economical with the truth in certain situations. And people uh, would sometimes raise questions about whether that's faithful to God or not. Whereas here you have God saying to Samuel um, right at the beginning, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. So it was clear he was going with a horn of oil to find one of Jesse's sons who was going to be king. That was the instruction Samuel was given. And when Samuel says, but his soul gets wind of this, I'm, I'm a dead man. And then the Lord says to him, well, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, he did go and sacrifice to the Lord, but that wasn't his primary objective. The primary objective was to go and find one of David's sons and anoint him as king. And it just raises for me the, the, this interesting uh, uh, balance of truths that had um, Samuel been compelled to tell the whole truth, the absolute truth, and nothing but the truth, he would have had to say to Saul, look, well, yes, you, you've been rejected as king. I'm going to go and anoint one of David's sons as king. Uh, but in a sense, he's told, well, don't focus on the anointing. Focus on the sacrifice. Go and offer sacrifices. Focus on the sacrifices. And just tell Saul that's what you've gone to do. And certainly that's what he tells the, the townspeople when they come to meet him. He said, no, I've come to sacrifice. Um, and I haven't worked this through completely myself, but it does raise in the issue of sometimes uh, being economical with the truth might be the right approach and the loving approach and the sensible approach as Christians, um, uh, and pro quite likely a can of worms, <laughs> but uh, as I read this passage of, of Scripture, it just it, there's questions around it uh, in my mind. So Samuel goes down, and he goes to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town come and say, "Have you come in peace?" And he says, "I've come. Consecrate yourselves." And to consecrate themselves uh, in the Old Testament, you look in Exodus and Leviticus, uh, it would be a twofold. The one would be spiritually prepare yourself spiritually to come and sacrifice. But also there's a physical preparation of washing yourselves and going and changing your clothes so that you come clean and fresh before God as you come to sacrifice. And he then goes and consecrates 
JC as well. Uh, and we're given uh, some of JC's uh, genealogy in the book of Ruth, where we have uh, the story of Ruth as a Moabite, somebody outside of Israel being brought in um, by, in essence, by chance, meeting an Israelite, um, marrying him, a man named Boaz, uh, and then having children. We told um, in chapter four that uh, uh when she had the child, her mother-in-law took him in her arms, and we told the woman living there said, Naomi's son, and they named him Obed. So Ruth and Boaz became the father of Obed, and Obed told he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And the next little bit, they give the genealogy of David from uh, Perez. And it's one of those interesting things that you have here, Boaz being the uh, one of the ancestors, but married to Ruth, who was an outsider, somebody that Israelites w wouldn't have much time for. Uh, and yet she's brought into the, the line of David, which becomes ultimately the genealogical line of Christ as well. So, Jesse, and we're not told that there was anything particular about Jesse or that is a, the, sort of any issue in the family that, that made them appropriate to be the, the family that produced kings. It was just God's choice. Um, and there may well have been something, but we're not told what it was. Um, and then uh, at the feast, the sons start arriving. And he, Samuel sees Eliab who was the oldest of the, the sons, and he comes before him, and Samuel immediately thinks, this surely must be the Lord's anointed. Which, in terms of the Old um, Testament uh, and practice of the time, would make sense. The oldest son would always take on the family name. They had the most uh, uh, prominent position. The, the line was, was taken through the, the eldest son's, um, the oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance when his father passed away. And so uh, sort of the, the oldest son would always would be the natural person to look to. Uh, and not much has changed today. Uh, you still have many royal lines running through the oldest son. And it's only recently that um, in the last couple of years that in the UK, they've changed to say that it's the eldest child. So whether it's a son or a daughter, the oldest child will now become the next monarch in in England. And so after Charles passes on, um, it will be William, then it'll be George, and then we, we who knows? <laughs> George has got a couple of decades before he hopefully provides another heir apparent to the throne. So one can, can completely understand Samuel's position made perfect sense that Eliab would be the natural choice for a king. He looked the part um, and uh, yeah, God says, don't consider his appearance uh, or his height for I've rejected him. Um, and God saying, you're looking at the outward appearance of the man. Um, says the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart and the outward appearance was one of the notes that they made for King Saul and what he looked like and if we go to uh, 1 Samuel and chapter let me see chapter 9 where we meet uh, Saul we're told Kish had a son named Saul as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel he was a head taller than anyone else. So as we introduced to, to Saul, that's one of the first things we told about him, that he was this good-looking uh, person and uh, tall and clearly kingly material <laughs> from a worldly perspective. Um, 
and as he's anointed king, <coughs> chapter 10 and verse 23, they find Saul when they want to anoint him and they bring him. They, we're told in verse 20, they brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among the people. Um, and so uh, uh, it looks to Saul's outward appearance. And we know as it continues that Saul's heart was completely in the wrong place. Um, but we also, uh, uh, when you're thinking of how God looks at the heart, it, it's picked up again all the way through Scripture um, where God talks about people as a man after my own heart. And in John, Jesus, uh, we're told, uh, could look at people's uh, heart. Uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 25, uh, Jesus uh, goes to the Passover festival and people see what he's doing. But he told he wouldn't entrust himself to them for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind. Or he knew what was in each person. He looked at the inside and Jesus could see what was going on um, within people. And in the beginning of Acts, we have the same uh, comment made in Acts chapter 1 and verse 24, uh, where they're uh, looking to replace Judas and they bring forward Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias, and they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this ministry which Judas left. You know everyone's heart, and they recognize it's the heart that the person has that is critical. And God says that to, to Samuel as he's looking at these wonderful uh, specimens of young Israeli men, Jewish men, ready to, to lead. God says, no, that you're looking at the outside. I'm looking at the inside, at their heart. And so Elia passes before him. They then have Benadab, the next born, also not him. Then Shammah comes along. And, and they all pass, come before Samuel. And it's clear none of them are going to be king. And he's, uh, Samuel then says to Jesse, uh, uh, the Lord has not chosen these, uh, and he asks, "Are there any? Uh, are these all the sons that you have?" Now, whether he explained to Jesse what he was there to do—that he's looking for the heir apparent—what Jesse would have understood when he's told, "The Lord has not chosen these," um, we're not told. Samuel was clear about what he was doing. How much he told other people beforehand, we're not told. So. What Jesse made of what Samuel said um, isn't clear. And also there may have been a whole lot of discussion between Jesse and Samuel that we're not hasn't been recorded because very often scripture will record what is important um, and not every single detail. Um, so the bottom line is seven sons of Jesse, none of them are chosen. And when Samuel asks about it, they say there's the youngest and he's tending the sheep. The youngest counted for nothing. They'd sent him off, didn't even invite him to the feast, left him in charge of the sheep um, because they'd written him off. So the youngest had no standing whatsoever um, and he had no real need to be at the feast. So they were happy to leave him. Uh, but Samuel says, no, send for him. And as they brought him in, uh, again, to sort of, we know that God's looking for his heart, but at the same time, we also told that he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Uh, and I, uh, I think one of the older translations has that he was uh, he, he was ruddy. He came in. Uh, he was a ruddy young man. And I, I know exactly how they describe it varies from from uh, translation to translation. But bottom line is uh, he was young man, youngest in the family, fit and healthy, uh, good looking, and God says he's the one. So 
So Samuel takes the horn of oil that he brought and anoints him in the presence of his brothers. Um, and he, he anoints him almost privately. He doesn't do it at the festival in front of everybody because that would then get out very quickly to Saul who, and that would complicate things tremendously. He does it in sort of privately with the family so that it um, doesn't create problems uh, before, before time, but also that there are witnesses to, that to Samuel's anointing. And so uh, he uh, does this. So David's anointed and the spirit, we're told, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord comes powerfully upon David. So it wasn't so much to make him king as to put the foundations for his kingship. So clearly Samuel saying, God has chosen you. And that's a critical um, point. And the spirit of God comes on him. Uh, and Roger, if we continued reading, we would find that uh, the spirit of God came on him and had departed from, from Saul. Because if we keep reading in verse 14, we told, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord to tormented him. Uh, we won't get into the evil or injurious spirit from the Lord <laughs> tormenting him. That's a, another whole study on its own. But just this notion that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Um, earlier on, it was clear that the Spirit of God came upon Saul um, at a number of, of points. There's a number of times where we told that the Spirit of God came on Saul. In chapter 10, uh, as Saul comes to become king, uh, he's looking for his donkeys. He meets Samuel, who anoints him as king, and then says to him, now you can go on your way. He uh, says, after that, you'll go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you'll meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high places. Um, they'll be uh, prophesying. The spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you'll be changed into a different person. Um, and Saul goes along and that is exactly uh, what happened. In verse 10, we told when he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully on him and he joined in their prophesying. And all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets. They asked, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And so the Spirit of God came on Saul powerfully and obviously and clearly, and it wasn't just in that, that one point where there's a number of other points, verse chapter 11 and verse 6, uh, there's uh, uh, one of the towns of called Jabesh was, was captured and uh, the leaders come and they, they tell the, the bad news. And in verse 6 of chapter 10, of 11, sorry, when Saul heard the, their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He chopped out some oxen, sent them around Israel, said, this will happen to anyone that doesn't come, and the whole of Israel flocked to him to be led into battle. Um, and so we have this, this clear sort of picture in the sort of earlier chapters that of the Spirit of God coming on Saul and being with Saul and helping Saul and guiding Saul. Um and then uh, Saul turning away, not listening to God, not walking in his ways, not obeying. When he's confronted with what he's done, he doesn't repent. He makes excuses. And one wonders what if when Samuel came and said, what have you done? If he immediately repented and said, ah, the men overcame me, they were too strong. I, I didn't obey the Lord. I repent of it. Um, much the way David did when uh, he was confronted by Nathan over Bathsheba, uh, he immediately acknowledged his sin, said, I've sinned, and 
repented. Um, but Saul didn't. He defended himself, justified what he's doing, and so uh, the, the Spirit of God left Saul. Which, uh, and so it's an interesting thought of, of um, challenge to us that the Spirit of God may come on people, um, and when they turn away, when they stop listening, stop walking with God, the Spirit of God may well depart from them like he did with Saul. And there are a number of people that I've seen who have um, been involved in the church, had powerful spiritual ministry, um, used by God to do great things. They, they walked with God for a number of years. They then falter and drift. And eventually you look and you say, how did they get to this, this position? Um, and in Saul's case, the Spirit of God came on him, used him, worked in him, and at a point the Spirit of God left Saul. Um, and so there are people, and a, a number of people that I've heard of that have come through St. Luke's, that uh, when people talk about them from 30 years ago and what they were doing, wonderful, uh, charismatic, involved, um, dynamic uh, with Christian witness, and today they have no witness whatsoever um, and uh, have left the church or, or drifted into some kind of neo-paganism that has a slightly Christian flavor to it. Um, and so the Spirit of God leaves Saul and we told the Spirit of God came upon David powerfully. And that's the beginning of the story of David as he takes over as king. Right. Questions and comments? Um, This is a slightly a music aside, but talking about David being being good looking, there's a a tradition in Israel that he had not only was he good looking, he had beautiful eyes, red hair and freckles. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he, he was ready. Scottish. <laughs> That's what, yeah, who knows? <laughs> um. I was struck, Ian, just where, right in the beginning, the Lord said to Samuel, and then Samuel said to the Lord, there was obviously, there's that relationship, and he obviously Samuel was, was listening, and, I mean, obviously being discerning of what God was saying to him. And, and yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't just happen. It must be development of a relationship. But I also wonder, just thinking of the brothers, his brothers seeing all these guys going through and saying, no, not that one, not that one, and they Bring the youngest. I wonder how they were feeling as a as a as a family. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what's why, why is this little lighter deserve this? Yeah. <laughs> but if you if you continue reading when, when the story of, of David and Goliath, when David goes up to the battle, his brothers yeah. are very dismissive of him. <laughs> like, yeah. What are you doing here? What are you talking to these people for? You've just come to to watch the battle. You you. Go back to those few miserable few sheep that you should be looking after. <laughs> they're not, not very complimentary at all. No. So one wonders about the, the, the dynamic in the family. Again, <laughs> it's so, yeah. not critical. We're not told about it. Anything we have is guesswork. Yeah. The other dynamic from a family like that is, of course, with Joseph. Yes. Being the youngest son and him with the dreams and his brothers hated him, etc. So... Yeah, um, it, it might not always be an easy time. <laughs> yeah. It does I, seem I, like God has a habit of choosing the, the sort of the, the unlikely people, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the wrong people to to uh, get mm. into position of leadership. I was struck yeah. when uh, Saul says, says, talks to Samuel about the Lord your God. Not the Lord our God. He was already yeah. in a sort of a way separating himself. But mm. it was the Lord your God. Yes. 
What are you saying, Jeanette? Are you saying that Saul had already distanced himself from God? Well, or felt that God had left. Well, he wasn't where he should have been with God. I think that's about all I would say because. Why did he not say the Lord our God? Because that's a common expression all through the Old Testament, the Lord our God. Mm. And somehow when somebody talks about the Lord your God, it seems to imply some kind of drifting away, whether a deliberate separation or just a drifting. Mm. If we were to think a little bit more about being the youngest of the family, uh, in Joseph's case, almost the youngest, it's it's like um, Joseph didn't handle his uh, dreams and the, his brother's jealousy very well, um, but that was um, instrumental in putting him into a, a long-term plan for character building. And in a way, I suppose it was the same with... Um, the runt of the of Jesse's family that um, he also was um, maybe always been looked down upon by the, uh, uh, the his bigger brothers who couldn't and when anyway understand the anointing process, um, and David had to learn what that meant. Uh, maybe that's what turned La uh, David into a good leader uh, mm. later on because he. Um, he he'd been at the receiving end of a lot of um, uh, bad treatment, mm. and so maybe as a, as a leader in in the in the future, he was quite different. Mm. When you get, as when David was exiled, so to speak, he um, a whole lot of uh, discouraged people and um, dis, um, gathered to him. A wide range of uh, of people um, with uh, uh, who are, were behind with their taxes, or who were uh, lost their fields, or whatever it was. I mean, the, they they all came to him, and they 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 stuck to him. There was something about him uh, with which they could identify. Sounds almost like Robin Hood. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. But I think I think yeah, it, it is that that. Uh, he learned as he went along, and it's an encouraging thing that that that, um, that God uses our experience and what we're going through to shape us and equip us and fit us for His service. Um, and so, even I think yeah, David not only is suffering from, at the hands of his brothers, and because in their case it was mostly apparently just verbal, but on being on the run from Saul and having to. Um, yeah to lead these people and hold them and manage them uh, and learning to lead 400 rebellious outcasts fitted him to lead an army of thousands when he finally got, got, got to the throne. I think it's very interesting that there's a Gentile woman in the Lord's family tree. I, I find that yeah. very thought-provoking. And I was thinking about Bethlehem is the house of bread. Bethlehem, it's the house of bread. Now, sort of going back into the, the thought of Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the bread of life, born in the house of bread. And mm. a just going out beyond that, I, I'm I'm seeing the geography of it all because I know it, but the mm. fields around Bethlehem were not just any old shepherd's fields. They were the fields of the shepherds who looked after the flocks from which the temple sacrifices came. So there's Jesus, the Messiah, mm. who was going to be sacrificed, anointed, Born in the house of bread, the whole there's a whole a whole movement of the spirit around there. Hmm. Also, somebody's made the comment that, that if you look at the book of Ruth, it begins with uh, uh, Naomi and her family in Bethlehem, uh, suffering yeah. from a, a famine and having to leave the house of yeah. bread because there was no food, yes. and going off to Moab where um, 
uh, Naomi's son marries a Moabite Moabite woman, um, and then finally they, they come back. They hear that the Lord is blessed, and there's bread again in Bethlehem. So they come back to the house of bread because there is bread. Mm. So, uh, well, Jeanette, it wasn't just um, Ruth. Uh, only two generations before that. Um, was it Salmon uh, married um, Rahab? Tamar? Uh, yeah. uh, before, before that was Tamar. So, I mean, yeah. And then, there four... yes, and then was Rahab. So, yeah. Ruth and Rahab were the two Gentile women yeah. in, the, in the family tree of the Lord. Mm. I think it's. Uh... Also an interesting thought or a thought to ponder is why Saul was chosen in the first place. Um, God would have seen his heart and is it that Saul changed or was it a lesson for mankind because obviously it wasn't the lineage that Christ would come from. But... Um, Basically, you know the, the 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 whole failure of of Saul as as a choice um, is a marked contrast to to David. Mm -hmm. I think is the latter, any... Yolandi. I think it's the latter um, that um, the Lord allowed Israel to. Uh, he gave them a king when they demanded a king. Yeah, they didn't they see Saul, though. Uh, uh, God chose Saul. Yeah, all right. But he, he might have been the best of a bad bunch at that point. Um, <laughs> but still God's <laughs> choice for whatever reason. Sure. And well, Samuel, what that? Samuel did warn them what would happen if they chose a king. He told mm. them all that they could expect if they did have a king. Yes, yeah, so so what Saul put the first choice to teach mankind a lesson, or was it that Saul's heart changed because we have free will? Wow. Well, I, I would think ultimately it would, it would have to be that um, God's purpose is opaque to us, um, mm. and so he, he uh, because he would have known that Saul's heart would change. I mean, God. God's uh, omnipotent, omniscient, he's outside of time, he would know exactly what, ha what happened to Saul. So um, he had him anointed as king with that sort of full knowledge of, of how it would turn out. Um, and one can only speculate what the, what the purpose might have been, and it may well have been to establish uh, with Israel what a bad king was to underscore the, the fact that the king needs to be obedient. The, the obedience of the king to the word of God was was um, paramount. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the, the strength of the kingship would come from, rather than just from a good-looking military leader. Um, and so what one, one has no... Uh, <laughs> one, one can speculate of, of what were the lessons, but uh, and I think it, so God always does things with, with, with intention and purpose. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't always tell us what the intention and purpose is. <laughs> <laughs> and so we sometimes left sort of grasping. Um, and one day we can ask him, what was the story about Saul? <laughs> what was going on there? And he'll give us a clear answer. <laughs> but, yeah, I think I, I think it was a, uh, a preparation for the Davidic kingship and also a, a, a shaping of and one can, yeah, all sorts of things, of the, sort of to have a king that David could be part of his court because David was a court musician and lived with Saul and saw how kings worked and the whole political dynamics of, of the throne room. He would have been privy to that, which would have stood him in good stead for when he was king. Mm -hmm. um, and he wouldn't have been equipped in that way if there hadn't been a king that he could serve under kind of thing. So so exactly why and, and what the uh, the whole thing was is, yeah, we guess. Well, that wouldn't be the first uh, job shadowing was which uh, taught one that, that this is how I wouldn't do it. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> if I was to become king, I wouldn't behave like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but you've got the two sides of it. One of them is what you just said about learning about how the palace works and the, pa the power uh, structures within the, within the nation. And the other is, is actually being a man after God's own heart, which presume we, we don't get much inkling of this from, you know, we don't see any, anybody mentoring David, either as a shepherd boy or, or post uh, um, being anointed. But on the other hand, we do know that he spent a lot of time with his sheep and with his harp um, and and writing songs to the Lord. So uh, it, it, it appears that um, maybe having all that time on his own um, got him very close to the Lord, uh, to which we can then add, uh, so did St. Paul, who disappeared off to Arabia for a while mm. and uh, came back a changed person. So, I mean, there's... Of course, there's lots that we don't know, and there's not in the scripture. Um, so we'll enjoy speculating yeah. or writing historical novels. Yeah. But also, just one of those those points that, that, that one can speculate, um, and some some speculations make more sense than others. But you you can't use speculative ideas as a foundation for your faith and your thinking. Um, and so to to have if you speculate that that the the, the the second is always the best, God always uses the second person rather than the first king. Therefore it's not the first rector of this parish, but it's going to be the next rector. And you you, you sort of the minute you start building that into your theology, you you you're you are going to go wrong. You you've got to Sort of say we speculate on those things which we don't know, but we stand on the things that we do know and that are clear. And so the thing, that fact that God called David, why he called, had Saul before we don't know, but we know that Saul was disobedient, therefore we must be obedient. That's that's clear. Um, David, the spirit came on on David, therefore you need spiritual people in leadership. Um, there, there are a whole lot of clear and ob and almost obvious things you can take from this the speculative always just remains speculative yeah. other comments and questions i'm trying i'm trying to think of um i'm trying to think i'm thinking about benjamin and and Saul being from from that tribe, going back to Benjamin being the the favorite the favorite son, and the whole again a whole set of family complications there as well. Mm. I'm just trying to look up Luke's gene Luke's genealogy of Jesus. Well, I mean, think, think about it. They're, they're all descendants of Jacob. Uh, and I love the, the uh, um, Jesus, no, the Joseph, the, 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 the musical, uh, where they, they sing Joseph, uh, Jacob, a fine example of a family man, which of course he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> a most yeah. dysfunctional family. That's one of those interesting things that, that um, uh, as debates are, to rage around what marriage is and what Christian marriage is and how, how Christian marriage should work and what should and shouldn't be part of it, uh, there's no injunction in Scripture against polygamy. Um, uh, that is stated in the New Testament that, that a Christian leader needs to be the, the, the husband of one wife. Um but average, the average Christian and anyone else in the church, there's no indication of that polygamy is frowned upon. But at the same time, every example of polygamy in Scripture is a disastrous family situation. So the 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 the, the, the cards are stacked against it, and it really looks like a bad idea that you wouldn't want to support because of the examples that you have. Yeah. and you, even David. 
David had a number of wives, and you look at his his children, and uh, it's a complete mess. We never heard about Abigail's children, who we hoped would be very wise. We one one would hope so. Right. And again, going back to going back to the 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 the, the family line. It's interesting that Mary and Joseph were both from the line of David. Hmm. Both of the house of David. Hmm. Right, let us close with prayer. Oh Jesus, we we thank you for your word and we can see how you work your purpose out in often unexpected and unusual ways. We pray that you'd help us to be prepared to be like Samuel, listening to your voice and walking in obedience to you. We pray, Lord, that we'd be like David, that we'd be filled with your spirit and enabled to minister in the role that you call us to. And so, Lord, we pray that you would work in us uh, and in your church mm. to make a difference in the world. And Lord, today we pray particularly for political leaders in this country as they they try and form uh, governments, uh, try and work out uh, how to move forward. And Lord, we know the, the, the animosity and the, the rancor and the, the problems that there are between the parties we're aware of factionalism and tensions within parties. And Lord, we pray that you just raise people who could get beyond that, who would be able to uh, move into a position of looking for the best way forward, for the best number of people, for the best results, for the whole people, rather than what is politically expedient what works best in the party context and what is in their own interest so lord change people's hearts raise people up to leadership in the same way that you raised david from an unexpected position lord we pray that you could do that again mm. in uh, the parties as they, they debate and discuss lord that from out of nowhere in, in essence you'd raise up leaders who could take us forward on your path so Lord, we, we hold the process up to you and pray for your intervention. Mm. And Lord, we pray that you'd give us patience and strength as we walk the journey as a nation. Amen. Amen. Amen.